All right, this concept clearance proposes to renew the Centers for Mendelian uh, Genomics uh, program. The uh, proposed um, purpose uh, for the renew is uh, to bring the field forward towards the goal of solving um, all or most of the Mendelian disorders in the foreseeable future by solving as many Mendelian disorders uh, as possible at the funded centers and by enabling and coordinating with the, re with the uh, rest um, in, over the world. Um, by solving Mendelian disorders, um, I mean identifying the uh, underlying genomic defects um, of uh, Mendelian disorders. And for the rest of the presentation today, I'm going to stick to uh, the term solve. This slide summer, uh, highlights the main achievements made by uh, the three current uh, centers for Mendelian genomics, uh, often referred to as uh, CMGs. And these centers have been founded by NHGRI and uh, NHLBI since November 2011. Uh, together, uh, they have demonstrated the power of sequencing at scale for solving Mendelian disorders. They have uh, so far discovered a uh, soft uh, um, over 165 Mendelian disorders. Uh, in the process of solving Mendelian disorders, they have um, also made discoveries of uh, phenotype expansions of about 120 Mendelian disorders. By phenotype expansion, I mean the discovery that uh, the phenotypes start, uh, started and uh, turn out to be underlined by the same genomic defect underlying a previously already solved uh, genomic uh, uh, Mendelian disorder, and except uh, the phenotypes were not previously uh, observed or uh, documented. Um, some of these studies have been published in just over 100 publications so far. And along with others, uh, the CMGs have also revealed to a much uh, greater extent than previously anticipated uh, 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 the pleiotropy and genetic um, heterogeneity underlying Mendelian disorders. And uh, they have developed uh, methods and tools and uh, data source um, in the process of uh, solving Mendelian disorders and the effort for disam uh, disseminating these resources have, uh, have been ongoing. Um, so the progress made by the Mendelian centers and a few other uh, similar efforts and the knowledge on the, and the estimate on the remaining Mendelian disorders to solve have uh, largely informed uh, this concept that I'm presenting today. So um, how much uh, remaining work lies ahead? Uh, this is uh, a summary of uh, uh, current estimates. Um, there, um, uh, for, for about uh, 3,600 Mendelian disorders, uh, there is a known uh, genomic uh, basis. You will notice here that I used the term molecular basis uh, rather than genomic basis, and that's because uh, uh, that's uh, the term that uh, OMIM uses. And so maybe some of the molecular bases here refer to uh, non-DNA molecular bases, but uh, essentially about 3,600 Mendelian disorders have molecular bases. And uh, about an uh, equal number of uh, Mendelian disorders still remain to be solved. Um, every year, there's still an uh, additional number of uh, Mendelian disorders uh, described. S in conclusion, much work uh, remains to be done in order to solve all Mendelian disorders. Um, this and the next several slides um, Present will present the proposed scope and objectives um, for the renew. Um, the first objective is to solve 300 or so Mendelian disorders uh, in order to learn 
the approaches and uh, methods and uh, scale and technologies that uh, it, it will take to solve almond eating disorders. And the second object, objective, which is um, as important as the first one, if not more, uh, to enable others and coordinate with others um, by developing and disseminate uh, methods and other resources and uh, reach out, coordinate with other uh, researchers over the world in order to meet the ultimate goal of solving all or most of the Mendelian disorders. Um, we came up with this uh, uh, production goal of solving 300 or so Mendelian disorders based on the um, NHGRI funding level that I'm going to propose in a few minutes, also based on the progress that the CMGs have made so far in solving Mendelian uh, disorders, also based on uh, the expectation for improvement of efficiency and costs, and uh, the anticipation that there will be fewer low-hanging fruit disorders uh, left to be solved. Uh, in other words, the decrease of per exome cost and the increase of per disorder cost may cancel out. Um, so um, these three factors all together led to the um, estimate of uh, this uh, 300 Mendelian disorders as a uh, production goal. Um, there are two more general goals that uh, we wish that, that, that we believe the, uh, th that we believe solving 300 Mendelian disorders will enable us to still meet. One is to understand the genetic characteristics of uh, uh, Mendelian disorders as a group, and the other is to learn what it will take to solve all Mendelian disorders. Um, it is our judgment that uh, 300 uh, represents a significant magnitude in terms of scale and the range of uh, disorders um, that will allow these two obje uh, objectives to be, to be met. Um, and um, we are also um, introducing uh, two new features to uh, uh, the program uh, for the next iteration. One is that um, when when, for example, exome sequencing fails uh, to lead to insight when uh, appropriate, um, whole genome sequencing should be implemented in order to explore the entire genome. And the other uh, change to introduce to the program is to um, allow a very small percentage of CMG funds to be spent for small-scale function assays. And this will be a different difference to the current program. Of course, uh, we are going to continue to expect uh, uh, follow-up uh, function assays after variant discovery to be largely performed at the collaborators' uh, place. And um, finally, um, I should mention that uh, this goal is uh, set up based on, as I said, um, the NHGRI funding level that we're going to propose. And we are going to seek co-funding from other ICs. Uh, currently, NHG, uh, NHLBI puts in $2 million to the program um, every year. And should that amount of money be available, or hopefully other um, sources become available, um, this goal will go up from 300. Um, my, my estimate is if, uh, if $2 million um, become available again from heart and lung every year, then the goal could raise um, from solving 300 to 400 Mendelian dollars per year. I mean, it's through the entire uh, uh, iteration. And then um, moving on to the next um, objective, of, uh, the, for the proposed to renew, uh, enabling and coordinating with others. Um, in, in the process of uh, uh, solving Mendelian disorders, and there will be uh, necessary refining and uh, development of uh, approaches and tools 
and um, ways to uh, improve efficiency and cost and uh, improved uh, data analysis methods for difficult genomic regions. These methods, these methods, um, we're going to require dissemination of these methods as community resource. In addition, data release um, is going to be an important uh, feature of the program that we're going to continue to emphasize. And data release will entail uh, dbGaP sequence data release and uh, posting of uh, causal allele information, which would uh, include um, simple and brief information about the d disease names and, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, location and uh, 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 genomic changes of the causal allele at a public CMG browser and then link to other sites including um, ClinVar. And um, also, um, the CMGs are now coming together to um, work out um, issues in the consent process so that data can be pulled together for them to come up with uh, allele counts from the pooled sequence. Uh, we anticipate uh, this um, to be done before this funding period ends and uh, to continue through the next iteration. But, and, um, but uh, a better, out, uh, a better um, outcome may be that uh, the CMG data and other programs data could be pooled. So the last um, part of the uh, enabling and uh, coordinating with others um, are exactly about uh, uh, reaching out to individual investigators. Um, based on the um, current CMG's experiences, we anticipate that uh, training of uh, collaborators and other researchers uh, would continue to be necessary in order to equip them with the know-how for uh, sobbing and dealing disorders. And the program will continue to participate in uh, the International Rare Diseases Research, Cons uh, Research Consortium. And, and um, the last point is a very important point uh, to make, that is, uh, given the rarity of Mendelian disorders, um, as uh, Rod McGinnis point, pointed out at the recent uh, uh, July workshop, the goal um, of solving most or all Mendelian conditions requires unprecedented cooperation and coordination among clinicians and uh, scientists worldwide. Uh, we are going to con continue to uh, require public posting of the um, project lists in the CMG pipeline, and uh, we are going to um, promote uh, matching of samples or candidate genes of the uh, disorders of uh, common interest. So those uh, were the two main objectives and uh, the scope proposed for the program. Um, in terms of uh, relationship to other NH programs, Adam already touched on um, uh, the anticipated interaction between CDVD and the CMGs, and he will talk about the interactions between, uh, uh, between these programs with the Genome Sequencing Program Coordinating Center. And the other two programs I list here are the NHGI-funded uh, CSER program and the NH Undiagnosed um, uh, Diseases Network. Um, for those of you who are not aware, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the current CMGs actually have a coordinating center affiliated to uh, the Mendelian Center at uh, University of Washington. So um, the, uh, a lot of these activities, um, the, a lot of the working group activities and steering committee activities and annual meetings and outreach efforts have been coordinated by the CMG Coordinating Center. And the CSER program also has a coordinating center. And these two coordinating centers actually have uh, worked out a communication channel. Excuse me. I, I guess I woke up everyone. <laughs> and, and these two coordinating centers have worked out a, a way of communication so that um, uh, patients who have not been diagnosed 
um, at uh, the Caesar uh, sites, particularly those uh, who are suspected of having Mendelian disorders, when appropriately consented, may be passed down to the CMGs uh, to be further studied for discovery. Uh, we, we haven't had an, a success um, in, in, in this um, uh, um, in, in, in this uh, uh, arrangement yet, but uh, we, we do have our um, communication established. And the um, NIH uh, UDN, as you all know, will also um, discover um, molecular bases underlying rare disorders. But, uh, but at least one of the differences is that the CMGs uh, largely study existing samples rather than uh, newly en enrolled patients. And uh, one of the uh, goals that the CNG program um, um, aims to meet is to, um, in, uh, to, to lower the undiagno undiagnosable diseases and increase the diagnosable diseases over time. Um, because uh, UDN uh, even though UDP um, has been very successful and ongoing, UDN is a relatively uh, newer program, but um, there have been some initial uh, communications between staff about any um, potential interactions between the program, between the two programs, and we have uh, a council member here advising UDN, so uh, any advice on any um, potentially fruitful interactions between these two programs would be appreciated. Uh, this slide summarizes the proposed mechanism and funds. Um, given the scale and uh, complexity of the program, as with the current CMGs, we propose to uh, continue to use a, a cooperative uh, agreement mechanism. And uh, the program, um, including the grantees and staff will continue to see, will uh, regularly seek advice and guidance from an external scientific uh, panel. Um, both, uh, uh, both the representative grantees and staff will be required to participate in steering committee and working group activities. And um, we propose um, 40 million NHGRI funds for the four-year period, um, which is at the current level, and uh, $10 million annually. And as I mentioned, we'll seek co-funding from other NH institutes. And the RFA uh, will fund up to three centers, and it will be open to all participants. Uh, So this is the last slide. Um, just um, to summarize, I have presented a concept that proposes to fund um, uh, men, uh, centers for Mendelian genomics with uh, 40 mini total NHGRI funds um, aiming to solve 300 or more Mendelian disorders and to enable and uh, coordinate with uh, others and to meet the ultimate goal of solving all or most of the Mendelian disorders in the foreseeable future. Uh, that's my entire uh, proposal. Um, are there any questions? I'll put on my glasses. All right. Yes, um, Howard. Th thank you. Uh, You'd mentioned, I think you used the term low-hanging fruit was already eaten, or you've already, you know, the, 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 uh, the most available data sets have been started on. Um, has anyone gone through the OMIM catalog and asked the question how many of the remaining um, diseases are, are likely to be, to even have samples or can be assessed? Because it won't be the full uh, number for sure. That's an excellent um, question. You know, how, how hard is the next set going to be, I guess, is what I'm looking at. So, so my understanding um, from interacting uh, with the current grantees um, is that um, um, it's going to be an achievable goal to uh, solicit um, 
uh, quality samples. Um, I should have mentioned that currently the effort to solicit uh, samples and has been at a uh, low scale. Um, f um, one of the reasons is because when the current grantees um, came on board, um, you know, they brought um, in samples that they had solicited, solicited through years of uh, effort before the inception of the program. And the, the first question you asked was an excellent one. In fact, uh, the um, coordinating center at uh, UW just uh, went through uh, the exercise to, to look over all the listed Mendelian disorders that are included in all the disorders um, on OMIM, and together with uh, Ada Hamash, who is the peer of OMIM, and they have identified uh, a set of um, Mendelian disorders and uh, the, you know, the, the PIs who initially published on those disorders. And there has been discussion for the CMGs to go out, reach out to those PIs to see if uh, samples are, some of this, the, those samples are actually available. So the current, so the next iteration is going to need to give more funding support for, um, you know, a higher scale sample solicitation effort. Yes, Joe. Uh, yeah, Howard took part of my question. I was wondering about the bottleneck <laughs> Of, of this, but also coupled to what other institutes might be interested in partnering based on the samples that are out there, right? So I think you mentioned NHLBI was potentially going to partner again, or they had been an important partner. But I'm wondering if the limitation in finding co-partners is in fact finding diseases associated or with, the, with those institutes. So if you have a very large set, you can say, okay, we could go this direction. And, but we'd like to have co-support based on the disease focus of that institute. So if you had that population early, mm -hmm. you could potentially uh, interact with ICs in a way that says these are, these are the diseases that we're looking to go after. Yeah, if that's, yes. Versus the other way around of saying, yeah. well, we've got this great program and we're, we're working on diseases, something that would directly interest them. Is that uh, possible? Um, I, I think that's possible, Joe. Um, just a few words about um, the current collaboration with Heart and Lung. So um, the contribution mm -hmm. of their dollars uh, represent about 16 percent of the um, of the total funding level. And what Heart and Lung has been doing is to publish XO1s to solicit samples that uh, represent and heart or lung or blood phenotypes. And um, the XO1 mechanism has not um, brought in enough samples to consume 60% of their funds, but um, has had some success. And um, what, the grant, what we ask the grantees uh, to do is to, uh, you know, purposely choose heart or lung or blood uh, samples in the samples they already have and also pay attention and when they go out and solicit samples to be sure that they will feed the pipe, pipeline, 16% uh, of the pipeline um, that can give, um, um, uh, that can lead to um, discoveries and, uh, and, and there have been some um, good publications coming out of uh, uh, the joint effort. So. So I think um, looking into uh, the samples uh, the grantees uh, will already have and the grantees might already have and uh, the network they have already built, and there could be something presentable to other potentially interested ICs. Okay, I have Carol, then Dan, then Bob, and then Val, and then Juan. So Carol. So in looking at the current centers, there, there seems to be a distinction between solved and completely solved. Yes. So <laughs> I'm wondering if you, I, and just for my own education, can you uh -huh. clarify on what the distinction between those two things are? What do you mean when you say solved and what's the difference between solved and completely solved? 
Okay. So um, first of all, um, given where we we see the advantages of the these central efforts are, um, we have um, uh, required uh, uh, that they focus their dis uh, their effort on discovery of uh, um, you know the quote unquote um, causal uh, variants, which I'll give which I'll define for you in a minute. And then um, we uh, are going to continue to uh, urge the grantees to rely on their uh, collaborators to um, perform um, function assays, uh, which will help um, validate uh, the discovered um, causal or, or underlying variance, if that's a better term. And so um, in, in order to um, be able to call um, completion of, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, to call uh, when, it's, when uh, would be a good time to, com uh, you know, complete a project. The CMGs have defined that a um, variant uh, that uh, they have discovered to uh, associate um, with the disorder under study has to be discovered in at least and two other um, families, so that that's their definition of a uh, um, project, uh, you know, project uh, completed and uh, disease solved. I, I don't know that. Um, I don't know that. Uh, uh, you know, there there will be um, absolute proof of causality, um, and the other layer um, to this question is that. Um, th there are um, some Mendelian uh, disorders that can be um, partly explained by the discovered um, underlying genomic uh, defect. And because of genetic uh, uh, heterogeneity, um, you know, the, 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 the underlying gen genomic defects cannot explain every individual um, that suffers from the same syndrome. Modifiers and also, and, and uh, heterogeneity. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, Dan. So, Carol asked sort of much of my question. So again, I'm, I'm going to focus on words. I, I think solved is the wrong word because uh, I, I think of, so I'm a cardiovascular guy and I think of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or long QT syndrome. You know, from at one level, those are solved. And at another level, 20 years later, they're still not solved. There's still people out there. There's still other genes that remain to be discovered. There are compound heterozygotes. There are modifiers. So at what point do you stop work, working on those and let the community do those? So I think solved is, again, sort of not quite the right word. And I understand the appeal of using it. But uh, the, other, the, other, um, the other question I had was this, I think the, the the function is uh, underplayed and uh, and really very vaguely described in this document. I mean, it's just there's just a you know somebody will do function and there's even the term small amount of function or something and and at some point function becomes important because otherwise you really have no confidence that the variant does anything. And the third point that I wanted to make was that that maybe the reason NHLBI has been interested is because there are these high profile. Not so rare diseases, it turns out, but we didn't know that when we started. But I'm sure that the Eye Institute and the Kidney Institute and, and, uh, you know, and the neurological guys, all those people might be equally interested and have, have, have investigators have families. Can I, can I follow up on that, though? Are these centers the right place to approach function? The, well, that's a great question, but I, I think that, that you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't say a little bit of function is what we want. We either do function or we don't. Uh, so, you know, what we have considered again and again is that, um, you know, function assays, um, you know, for Mendelian disorders and actually will be all sorts, you know. So it will be very hard to scale and also um, we, 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 you know, consider a lot about uh, what the available funds can do most effectively. Well, let me take my answer back a little bit and say that, you know, 20 years later, most of the variants that cause hypertrophic cardiomyopathy don't have 
We don't understand their function to, to this day. Uh, and uh, so that you can have a, you can send an army of people to work on function and still not get to an answer. So I, I but I think that, that this sort of lip service to function maybe is is the wrong way to spin it. That say maybe maybe we should say function is not part of this. Um, find, find, I, I find take a variant and then and then let somebody else prove it. Um, uh, I, 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 I I don't know how, maybe. And maybe at the end of the day, you've put more time into it than I have, and you've probably phrased it right. I don't know. We probably don't want to spend too much time on this. I have a feeling function sneaked in here because many of the grantees have trouble publishing these manuscripts without exactly. some aspect of function in it. Okay, we that's, have that's part of that. That's actually the main reason. When, when a collaborator does not have the capacity or expertise to do some function assays, then we are thinking about allowing the grantees to perform a few in order to publish. Okay, we have Bob and then Val, Lon, and Howard. So I had a, a couple of points. One was there's a lot of Mendelian disease discovery going on through commercial laboratories that are doing whole exomes. And I'm wondering what efforts are made to try to capture that information um, because, um, I mean, if, if, if you just look at one large but currently unnamed uh, clinical laboratory, um, they have, quote, solved uh, 500 disorders uh, that they have studied in the last couple of years. And that's already greater than the 300 that you've proposed. So there's a lot of sequencing going on. It's not being paid for uh, mm -hmm. by NIH, and we should get that information in. Uh, the second question I wanted to, to, to ask about is um, whether there should be any increased attention to picking appropriate populations that have a lot of first cousin marriages, et cetera, that would help with finding rare Mendelian disorders. And the third thing I wanted to raise to you is about the, the func function question. Um, I mean, whenever I have found anything in a Mendelian disorder that's a genetic variation, the first thing I do is I go and look at the literature and I find the world's expert on the function of that protein. And I don't care where that person is. And the likelihood that they're going to be in my institution or even in my lab is vanishingly small mm -hmm. to zero. Mm -hmm. And so um, maybe you should consider some kind of uh, supplement that would allow people to, um, excuse me, that would, that would allow people to reach out and have a small amount of funding uh, through a supplement mechanism to try to work up the function in the hands of the people best suited to do that function. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So all excellent points. Um, and to your first point, um, it, it's actually good news uh, to, uh, it's always good news to, to learn about other ongoing efforts at scale in, for the ultimate goal. And that, that is precisely why the program is going to continue uh, to push for sharing on, of a disorder uh, list. Okay. Uh, uh, Val. Well, much of my comment was already said, but it's, I picked up on the low-hanging fruit thing, too, and now going for the high-hanging fruit <laughs> seems to me that means uh, smaller families, fewer cases, less well-defined phenotypes, greater heterogeneity, which all leads uh, to uh, more mistakes or more false positives. And so thus I was going to comment on the function part. My comment a little different is uh, I, th I think that means uh, that there does need to be a, a more strict criteria of what actually solve means. And, and uh, uh, that may indeed mean a function. I like Bob's uh, comment about, yeah, where do you go to get the function? And it probably is to the experts somewhere else. Uh, but I would agree then that a supplementary uh, proposal uh, Thank you. would be a good idea. Thank you. Um, uh, I take all of your comments about uh, the importance of uh, um, doing functional assays to at least to a certain extent validate the variant discovery. Um, I, I wanted to point out that so far 
the CMGs have been doing quite well to rely on their collaborators to perform uh, function assays. But, but they, they have run into cases from time to time when the sample providers don't have the um, expertise and capacity to do functional analysis. And that's when um, it becomes um, helpful to um, go out to the right expertise who actually didn't provide samples. So I, I, I understand your comments and, and thank you for the advice. I want to go back to Bob about uh, the second point you raised. And we have one, um, among the three current centers, we have one center um, who has done a lot of uh, sequencing of uh, consanguineous families. And uh, that has actually turned out to be quite um, productive. Yeah, in, in, in identifying very extreme phenotypes. It's just I'm, I'm, I'm wondering whether we could do more to reach out to the populations and the countries where these samples exist and these families exist and have a quid pro quo of, of helping them understand and deal with the problem and also contributing to the research and ma ma making sure that those populations in those countries don't feel like they are being exploited but instead are partners in an important discovery. Thank you. So there's a common theme coming out here, so I'll be brief on mine because I think Bob and Dan and others have stated it. I'm really excited about this, actually. I think this is, this is great. I think it will work, and I, and I think it will work at scale. Um, and it comes back to that, that question then, if it works at scale and you have 300 all of a sudden diseases out there and you take the patient perspective, apart from validation, which we can get through, there's nothing they can do about it. And so, so I, th I think we owe it to ourselves to have some statement of what the follow-up is of the initial discovery here uh, and not just not just leave it behind. If it's a supplement, great, if, but we have to have some stance, it seems to me, and not just leave it hanging because, because, because it will work, and it will work uh, for a lot of new diseases. Can I just press you? What, what, what do you have in mind? I mean, well, I mean, so, so you're, I mean, it takes us back to Huntington's or something, right, where we know the defect, but we can't do anything about it. And um, so it is exactly what Bob was saying. Can we find some mechanism, not just to validate the the defect itself or the causal variant, but to begin to understand what it's doing. And only then do we start talking about solving it uh, to me. But, but is, that, is that going to be a practical thing for NHGRI to do? I think, or? I don't know that NH, I think we need a stance on it, right, out of this. What, what are the steps? Are we going to facilitate ICs coming in? Are we going to provide potential supplements? I, I don't know what that solution is, but I don't, I don't think you can just leave it hanging, personally. I, th I think something has to come out of this. Um, Howard, you had your hand up. I don't know if the point already got made or you wanted to. Uh, I just wanted to say that I think on the function side, it's, yeah, it's, I think on the function side, we just want to give these guys uh, some latitude. And so whether they're coming in on a, on a supplement or they want to come in on, uh, um, as use some of their own resources, I think we got to give them a little bit of latitude. They're not asking for a huge amount on this, so I'm supportive of that side of it. I do want to be careful on it and come back to, you know, the whole utility side. There's a whole series of issues around that. And so just making a diagnosis for some families is really a lot. And so I just think we want to be careful on how far we want to push that uh, with, within this institute relative to the other ICs. Thank you. I guess one other quick comment about this issue about who does functional studies is that in general, what I've found is that if you pick the right collaborator, it actually will not require a lot of money because they've already got everything set up, they know exactly what to do. In fact, that's a biomarker for being the right person to have chosen. Uh, uh, maybe not sufficient, but at least necessary. All right, so no further comments. Can I have a motion to accept the concept as, okay, can I have a, se I've got a second. <laughs> uh, all in favor, please keep your hands up. Okay, any opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. <laughs>